going to read today. You have the rules together with a very short translation. This translation, as you will see, is partly based on the Vutti. There is no other way around, so we have to do it in this way. And then for each rule, you have one example that illustrates the main point of the rule. So I will be referring sometimes to this handout, but not, not too much because the main, the main point of the, of the session, again, like in other classes, is not so much to read the grammar and try to understand uh, the grammatical doctrine or the grammatical teaching, but to try to understand how this teaching is delivered, how it is given. And last day we were trying to understand how Anubuddhi works. Today we will see a little bit more of that, together with how Anubuddhi works when there is optionality involved. Optionality means that uh, for certain rules, more than one option is acceptable. You have seen that in Pali many times. You have seen that, uh, for instance, for the ablative singular, you can say Buddha or Buddha Ma or Buddha Sma, etc. So there are different Pachayas, or in this case, different Vibhaktis that you can attach to the base Buddha in order to form a correct word. So how does a grammarian provide for all these different possibilities? That's the question. And as you will see, one of the mechanisms of doing that is using option markers. That means uh, markers that say, optionally, you can also introduce that affix. So if you remember in the first session, we saw an overview of the structure of the Kachayana grammar. This is more or less the, the, the map, or the topic wise, the map of the Kachayana. And what we're going to see today is only this, this much, the beginning. Not really the beginning, we are going to skip or go very fast through the definitions because they are simply definitions and some of the terms are very clear and I think many of you are already familiar with them, such as sara, which means vowel, vyanjana means consonant or the syllable. What we are going to read really is uh, part two of the Sandhi section that's uh, about vowel Sandhi, that means the ligature of vowels, when one vowel meets another vowel. That could be a kind of, kind of romantic story. So when a vowel meets a vowel, that would be the title of today's, today's class. Uh, if we want to summarize the first part of the Sunday, that's the beginning of the Kachina, we skip rule one, which is very uh, kind of introductory. And straight away in Kachina two, we have a definition of the term Akkara. And the definition goes like this, akkara is what follows. So, a, a, i, i, u, u, e, o, kaka, etc. So, these are the akkaras. When we say akkara, it can mean any of these sounds. Uh, rule three defines sara, that means vowel. And these are the vowels in Pali. A, a, i, i, u, u, e, o. And within the vowels, you have rasa, short, a, i, u, diga, that means long, a, i, u, e, o. Then in Kachana 6, you have the definition of Vyanjana, which is very simple. It means Vyanjana is the rest. Whatever is not vowel is a Vyanjana, as you can see in the list. Then the definition of Vagga, another concept that becomes useful in the grammar. That means literally a group. These are the groups of five following the sequence of sounds that have been given in Kachana 2. And you are probably familiar with this kind of arrangement because that it's, it's still used today in, in modern Pali grammars or Sanskrit grammars. These are the Vargas or Vaggas. And then in Kachina 8, there is the definition of Nigahita, that's uh, nasalization, sometimes called Anuswara. And then Kachina 9 is a Paribasa that we have seen before, that you can use the you can use the termino uh, terminology of the Sanskrit grammars if it's necessary. And rules 10 and 11 are very important, very interesting. They are concerned with writing. They tell us how to how to unite and, and separate words when they coalesce because of Sandhi. But the meaning of these two rules is a little bit complex, so to say, and we we are going to skip them because it's not uh, strictly necessary. These are the definitions that are given in Sunday 1. And having seen that, we can move directly to Sunday 2. This is what you have in the handout. You'll see that my translations in the in the presentation are not exactly the ones that you have in the handout. The handout is a kind of guide so that you can see uh, the, the whole chapter in, in one single page. So the chapter starts with a very simple rule that I think we have seen before, so it should not be very difficult. Sara sare lopam. If you if you remember, sara is a is a nominative plural, sare is a locative, and lopam is accusative. 
as you see in the booty, serà ko seré paré, l'open pop conti. That means the vowels seré paré, that gives the right context in the locative. When a, when a, when a vowel follows, they obtain pop conti, l'opa, a legion. That means they are elided. You can see the example, for instance, yes indriani becomes yes indian, that we have seen already. Now, what after after Kachina 12, we find Kachina 13. Va paro asarupa. Note that this rule begins with va, which is an option marker. That means literally or. And sorry, or. Uh, we can translate it simply as optionally. Many translators translate it as optionally. Paro, that means the following one, asarupa. And asarupa is an ablative, as you can see in the Vutti. Saramha asarupa. So if following what we said in lesson two, we take the ablative as meaning after something, so that means after a vowel, saramha, which is a sarupa, which is dissimilar, that means it's not similar, it's, it's dissimilar in shape or not similar in shape. Paro saro, that's the nominative, that's the, the, the thing that we will be replaced. Uh, lopa papoti. It obtains lopa. It is elided. It obtains elision. It undergoes elision. Wow, optionally. So here, just to understand what the meaning of sabarno sarupa means, they are synonymous. So a and a are called avanna. So when we say avanna, doesn't simply mean a. It means a and a. It includes all the vowels that have the vanna, the color or the shape of a. That it means short and long. Similar with E and E, similar with U and U. So U, U are Savanna, and E, E are Savanna, A, A are Savanna. Savanna or Sarupa means the same. They have the same Vanna or they have the same Rupa. And A Savanna or A Sarupa means dissimilar. So the rule that we have seen, uh, A Sarupa means it has to be a vowel that is not similar. So in the case of E, any other vowel that is not long E would be A Sarupa. I think that is more or less clear. So here you can see that nothing recurs from the previous rule except lopam papoti. That is because the, this nominative paro has replaced uh, sara and, and that changes the structure. So uh, asarupa also introduces a left context that we have not seen before. And uh, the locative that we have seen in the first rule, sare, uh, basically uh, disappears. And, and that the is word optional. Paro there. Sorry? The word poro there, that means the following. The following, yeah. yeah. And we understand, so yeah, it's the following, the following vowel. So the the word saro actually comes from from sare in the first rule. In the first rule, you have sara sare lopam. But this sare in the locative here changes to the nominative. Because actually now we are talking about the second, if, if you have two, two vowels, one uh, preceding one and the following one, in the first rule in, in Kachana 12, we are saying that the, the first one disappears, the first one is elided. In this one, we say that the following one is elided. So that's why the case ending changes here. So here, paro stands for the same swara that in Kachana 12 is expressed in the locative. That we understand from the meaning. It's not entirely clear from the simply form, from the structure, but we also need to look at, at the meaning and of course at the uh, at the buddhi. So that I think it will become a little bit more clear as we advance in the in the in the reading, because the way the anu anu works in Kachana 12, 13, and 14 is a little bit uh, complicated, but after that I think it's quite straightforward. Uh, the, the reason why it is complicated is, is, again, because of the economy of language. Try to use as, as less or lesser words as possible. And that, that will be the, the reason. So here, Bhaparo or Sarupa is like you. There is a lesion of the, of the preceding vowel or optionally, there is a lesion of the following vowel as long as it is following a vowel that is dissimilar. So that will be a requisite. Now, in Kachina 14, Again, we see a rule beginning with an option marker. That is kochi. Kochi asavannam plutte. That means sometimes asavanna, that means dissimilar, lutte. That in itself is difficult to understand. If we read the sutta, you can see that there are already bits that are coming by anubutti from the previous rules. 
So what we have to understand is Saro Paro from root 13, the preceding one, the following, the following vowel, Pubasare Lute, so Lute means Pubasare Lute, that is the result of Kachana 12. In Kachana 12, the preceding vowel has been elided. So after this elision prescribed in Kachana 12, Kochi, that means in some places or sometimes, Pasavanam Papoti. So it means, uh, if you see the examples, after you have an elision of the preceding vowel, the vowel that remains sometimes becomes a savanna. So it changes into a vowel that is dissimilar to itself. In this case, you have from na upeti become nu peti, and from nu peti, no peti. So u has changed into o. O is a savanna in relation to u. That's what this rule is saying. Here, uh, what what I'm most concerned with, or what I would like to highlight, is that this kochi, this marker, blocks or cancels the previous option marker, wa, in Kachina 13. And therefore, it opens an option within an option. So, in some ways, that, that I think the last line, maybe I should, I should maybe delete it, but I'm, I'm not so sure here. But, Kochi here is an option marker, it, it, it cancels the wa in Vaparo Asarupa. So you remember in the in the first lesson or the first session, we we had this slide. This is what we see usually. And our understanding should be something like what you see on the right. So there are different levels, there's a hierarchy in the rules. And if we apply this to the, the three rules that we have seen, simply based on the use of option markers and the anubuti. This is what we see, but this is what we have to understand. Otherwise, we can get a little bit confused. So here, va and kochi, they are both option markers, as we have said, and kochi in 14 blocks the option va. Therefore, it opens a new domain within the, or under, under the governance or under the domain of Kachina 12. So Kachina 12 is the general rule, Kachana 13 is a kind of exception to that general rule. Kachana 14 is an exception to that to that uh, general rule. Two is not an exception to to the rule 13. Now, with regard to the meaning of the option markers in in the Pali tradition, so specifically, I I mean the tradition of Kachana, which is one of the two main traditions of grammar. Uh, there is since the early uh, commentaries, the Mukamata Dipani of Bhimala Buddhi, that is 10th century common era, approximately. There is a saying or there is a, uh, a teaching that, that says that there are basically two different levels of option in the grammar. And we have four technical terms. Kwachi and Nava, they mean the same. And Va and Vivasa, they also mean the same. The, the stanza, this stanza is from, the, it's, a, it's a summary of this, of this idea, is found in the Mukamatasara, which was written probably around the 13th century in Pagan, in Myanmar, in Burma, by Guna Sagara. And that's a work that I'm, I've been editing. This stanza, actually, you will find it quoted in different places, both in traditional grammars and also in, in modern books. But I don't think anyone had actually, they, they saw where it comes from, because sometimes the traditional grammars, they quote it without saying where it comes from. It actually comes from the Mukamatasara. And the meaning is this, so the Pali says, Kochi nava chaye katta, yevuyena ikarupaka, ba vivasa samanatta, payeno vaya rupaka. The words kochi and nava, they have one and the same meaning, they have one meaning, one single meaning, they mean the same. They generally yield, or they produce, they derive one single form. Whereas the words va and vivasa, they have a common meaning, that is the same, they mean the same. They mostly yield two forms. The, the point here is that if we are generally, that's why it says yebuyena or payena, that means in, in most cases, not always, but in most cases, kochi and nava, they will, exp they will try to tell you that in some cases only one form is possible. When you have an option, only one of the forms is possible in some cases. But the words va and vivasa, they express an open option, so both forms are, are positive. It can produce two different forms, and they are both correct. So if we, if we check again the rules that we have seen, 12, 13, and 14, 
13 is a kind of exception or open uh, subdomain with respect to 12. 12 says that vowels before a vowel are elided, and 13 says, but optionally, a vowel following the similar vowel is elided. So, Kachana 13 is subordinated to Kachana 12. Similarly, Kachana 14 is also subordinated to Kachana 12, not to the preceding one, not to Kachana 13. And we have to read it in this way. Vowels before vowel are elided, but sometimes, Kachi, after this elision, the remaining vowel changes to a dissimilar sound. So this is how we have to read. That's why understanding the different levels is important, because the China 14 has to be read as following the China 12. Now, having read that, I think the rest will be a little bit easier, and we will also revise the, how Anubuti works. Here is from 14 to 15. We have seen 14 already, and now 15 looks pretty straightforward and it's very short, digam. So that's a sutta that you can all memorize, and at least you will know one sutta from Kachayana, as the sutta says, digam. So that means simply long. But how would you unpack the meaning of this sutta? We have seen that whatever in the previous session, according to the principles of Anubuti, whatever is not cancelled is recurs, comes again. And what is cancelled is something that was performing the same function. So here, digam, is an accusative, and as you will see, it actually performs the same function as a savannam in Rule 14. So the only thing you have to do is change the Vutti from 14 to 15, changing a savannam with digam. That's what you have. In 14, you have saroko paropu basarelu te kochi a savannam papoti. So this a savannam, you change it for digam, and you have the full meaning of the rule. In this way, you save a lot of energy, you don't need to say saroko paropu you just say digam. Kochasavannamnute, digam. It means also sometimes instead of becoming a savanna, it becomes long, digam. I think you can see the example in the handout. In the case of uh, na upeti, instead of becoming no peti, it becomes nu peti with a long u. You will find this in the very famous formula in Pali, yena uh, bhagava tenu pasankami. If you would look at the manuscript, sometimes it's tenu pasankami with short u, sometimes it's with long u. Both are possible, actually. So in this case, sometimes it happens. So here you can see that the adesa, the replacement in Kachana 14, is expressed with an accusative singular. And in Kachana 15, this accusative singular is blocking or cancelling the previous one. So the previous one does not recur, is replaced with digam. But the rest is the same, the rest recurs. This is how Anubuti works. This is a very basic example of Anubuti that anyone can understand. And it reminds us of the, the case one that we saw last day, but we are going to repeat quickly here how Anubuti or recurrence works. Suppose we have a, a rule uh, with three elements. Here, every color represents a function. So each element performs a different function in the rule. Now, suppose we have another rule coming after and we have an element performing the function yellow, but it's different than the first one. First we have Y, now we have O. The question would be, what is recurring here? What do we have to understand when we say O after X, Y, Z? As you, as you all guess, probably, we have to understand X, O, Z. That's very simple. And if we would have then another rule that would say P, and this P is performing the function of the pink, then you understand that whatever is not cancelled recurs. So the only thing that is cancelled here is the, the pink, the previous pink uh, element that is Z. Therefore, X and O recur. That we have seen last day, I think, is very clear. But let's look now into the optionality of some other rules that we have seen at the beginning of the class. We go back now and try to try to understand how Anubuti works at the beginning of this chapter. We have seen these two different levels, but how do we understand that from Anubuti? How does Anubuti work here? So this would be case two. We have, this is not exactly matching the Kachina 12, 13, and 14, but in the, the theory is the same. The theory that is operating is the same. We have a first rule with three elements with the three different functions. Then we have another rule with only one element plus a modulator, or in this case, an option marker and we call it option marker A. 
So here, the question would be, what is recurring? So whatever is not canceled recurs. Again, X and Z recur. So we read X, O, Z optionally. That, that would be. And then the problem, the problems begin here when we would have a third rule, which would say only P, that clearly is, is blocking the ping uh, element in two. So P is replacing Z, but we have an option marker B. What happens here? That uh, option marker B is canceling option marker A. And that has important consequences in the reading of Anubuti in line three. So you can maybe think for two seconds, what would you read here by Anubuti? You have uh, probably you will you will say that X recurs. There is no doubt about that. The main the main question would be if you have to read again O or you have to read Y. And the answer is you have to read Y. And the why you have to read Y is the following. It's because option marker A is giving you an option between Y and O. So what it what 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 the second line is saying is in, in the case you have X, Y, Z, this Y alternatively could be O. That that's what it's saying. But then you have another rule and it says again optionally P. But this optionally is expressed with a different option marker. By doing that, what you are doing is to, to subordinate this line three to the first one. And then what you are saying is basically, in the case that you have X, Y, Z, this Z optionally could be P. So in this way, you, you, you can uh, modulate the, the hierarchies and the different domains of rules. I hope that is more or less clear. So there are options, but you, you, an optional alternative always have to be between two elements. And you can see here that, uh, if, if, that if you would understand that uh, applies to Kachina 13 and 14, they are giving you options between two, two different elements. And so that's what we would have. I'm sorry, there's, I think the concert in the, in the other apartment is starting. We'll get closer to the microphone. Now, just for for the sake of understanding how this method works, we will see a case that we have not seen yet, but it can happen sometimes. Actually, it does happen sometimes in the Kachina. Uh, we call it case three. We start again with three elements. Then we have an option marker A. Then suppose we have another another rule and there is no option marker, there is nothing. So in this case, what would you what would you read by Anubuti? The option marker is not cancelled, but we are introducing P. So what would you read here? Unlike the previous example, unlike case two, here everything recurs. And if you would not have any other option marker cancelling option marker A, everything recurs. So you read X, O, P, and again option marker A. That's how, how usually in most cases Anubuti works. Yeah, everything recurs, that is not cancelled, that is not blocked. Now we have seen how uh, Digam has to, we go back to, to uh, 15, we continue our reading. 15 was clear, everything goes by Anubuti except Asawa Nam. And now we have Pubocha. So from the Bhutti of Kachane 15, you can see that this nominative Pubo is actually replacing the Paro. So the opposition is here, it's between what, whether the rule applies to the previous vowel or to the next, to the following vowel. And the, in Kachana 15, this digam applies to the remaining following vowel. Now, in Kachana 16, what is actually telling you is that also this digam, this lengthening, can happen to the previous remaining vowel when the following has been elided. So, in the note, you can see that this word paro is recurring from Kachana 13, and here it is finally cancelled by pubo, which uh, performs the same function. And the word cha indicates that the rest recurs. So kwachi digam papoti, this is all going down, it recurs. But the rest is changed because, because uh, of the pubo. So pubo indicates that we are already going to the to the earlier vowel if we have two different vowels. So to make it a little bit clearer, you have that uh, saro 
and Papoti, this comes from Kachina 12 by Anubuti. Saralope Kate Kwachi, that comes from Kachina 14. And Digam comes from Kachina 15. So all this information is being dragged down, is being carried by Anubuti. We continue the reading. And then after Pubocha, that means the, the preceding vowel can also become long sometimes. We have another another sutta that says yam edantasa adeso. That is a that is an interesting uh, sutta in the style of the of the grammarians. Probably if you just read yam edantasa adeso, apart from adesa, that means replacement. The rest is difficult to guess. What is yam? What is edantasa? I never seen a word like edantasa. But as you see in the in the Vuti, if you read the Vuti, it becomes clear. Uh, sorry, edantasa means e karasa antabutasa. That means the the sound e kara means the, the form or the sound of the sound e when it is at the end when it is at the end of a word. So this, uh, instead of the sound it's in genitive in the genitive instead of the sound e at the end of a word you have the replacement adeso yam. So yakara adeso hoti the replacement ya is there. You can see in the examples. Adigato ko miayam. Miayam actually means me ayam. So the e of me becomes ya. And you understand actually that uh, you could understand that it it becomes ya, and then that's why ya plus a makes a long a. But this a usually is understood as a as a lengthening. So me ayam becomes mi ayam, and mi ayam becomes mi ayam. It's not so important here. What I would like to to actually highlight is again the anubutti, how some words are recurring and some words are not recurring. You see that many words are not recurring. The main reason for that is that there is a sign or there is an indication in the formulation of this rule that tells you that the core, the core structure of the sutta has changed and that blocks the structure of the previous suttas. In this case, you don't have a formulation nominative accusative to say that something obtains something, but you have a formulation genitive and nominative. That means instead of something, you have uh, X replacement. So that changes the structure. That means uh, not much is recurring, but you have the Kwachi recurring, Sarepare also recurring from, from Kachana 12. We are still in the domain of Kachana 12. And this Kwachi is coming from, from Kachana 14. I think it's not indicated. Yeah, Kachana 14. That That's what you have. So in the uh, in the Vuti, you, you can see what recurs and what is new in the Sutta. Sarepare and Kochi, they are still recurring. They have not been cancelled. After Yam Edantasa Adeso, there is a rule that is uh, based on the same structure. That means nominative plus genitive. So there are certain things that will not, not change. Basically, we, we don't need to replace much. Here, Yam is nominative, edantasa is genitive. In the Kachina 18, you have vam, which is a nominative, and odu dantanam is a genitive. Odu dantanam simply means od means o, ut means u, and antanam again means when they are at the end of a word. So the rule is quite simple. If you look at the examples, koasa becomes kwasa, so the o is replaced with v. Uh, similarly, bahu avado, so the U is replaced with V. Yeah, so the structure is the same. You can see that in the Vuti of Kachina 17, you have Sarepare still recurring. In Kachina 18, Sarepare is not, Sarepare and Kochi are not cancelled, so they must recur. If we go back to the structure of the, these squares, if that is a little bit easier for visualization, this is what we what we would see. Kachina 17, Yam Edantasa. I skip adeso because that's understood. Sarepare recurring from 12. Kochi recurring from 14. In Kachina 18, you find again a nominative and you find a genitive. So obviously this nominative has already replaced the previous nominative. The genitive has replaced the previous genitive. But for the rest, obviously there's no change. Just keep reading Sarepare and Kochi. So you have a kind of domain and a subdomain, the domain of Kachana 12, the subdomain of Kachana 14. And these two rules are operating within these domains. 
So this is what we have. You can see in a different case. The modulator goes down, the right context in the locative goes down again, he's carried out, uh, carried down. After Kachana 18, Vam Odudantanam, then you have uh, the rule Kachana 19, Sabocham T. Again, uh, might sound a little bit strange. What is Sabo Chanti? If you look at the Vuti, Sabo Ich Eso Tisado. It is interesting that the, the Sandhi that the rule is teaching is already used in the Vuti of the same rule. That kind of irony is, is very common in the Kachana grammar. You will see, of course, the rules of Kachana used or misused sometimes in the in the Kachana itself. Sabo Chanti, as you can see in the in the Vuti, it means Sabo iti eso ti sado, so all the, all the word ti, that means the syllable ti, bien geno, that means the, the entire syllable, the block of, of consonant plus the vowel i, sare pare, that coming from 12, kwachi, sometimes coming from 14, chakaram, that, that means cham, means chakaram, it's accusative, papoti. And here it is important to know that one of the, the changes or the, the marks that tell, tell you that the anubruti is disturbed in terms of the core of the sutta, is that we are using the term sabo instead of anta. So the replacement does not affect the ending sound of a, of a word, but the entire word. This dichotomy is very, very common in the grammar. So there are replacements that affect the last sound or the first sound of a word, and there are replacements that affect the entire word or the entire expression. So here by saying sabo, we are already marking a, a difference or a break with respect to Kachana 18. And obviously, the fact that we are going back to the structure nominative accusative also marks a change in the, in the core of the sutta. So, vam odudantanam, this is obviously cancelled by these two elements. One is the what is to be replaced, one is the replacement. But the rest, as you can see, continues. Sarepare and kochi, they go down by anubuti. Now, if you are wondering how, if, if t is changed with cha, how this cha becomes chicha twice, like in itche so or itche tam kusalam, why there are two c's instead of one. The rule is only telling you that there should be one c. But there is another rule in Kachana, Kachana 28, that says paradwe babo tane. That means whenever is suitable, whenever is uh, necessary or possible, depend. Paradwe babo. There is a doubling of the of the next sound. So basically, you will have the the sequence iti asa would become ichasa with only one c, with only one cha. The, we don't find that. What we find is usually ichasa with two chas, with the germination of the cha. After sabo chanti, there is another rule, do tasa cha. And we go back to the structure nominative and genitive. So we go back to the structure that we have in 19. This, all these, these are variations on, on the structure that will, will tell you that there is a replacement of something with another thing. That is explained in the, in the session or the lecture number two of this series. So if, if you want to refresh, you can, you can go back there and see what is the core of the, of the replacement, what are the left context and the right context, etc. Alex, but, sorry, could I ask you just to go back one slide? Yes, this one. And uh, yeah, and I just want to, to clarification if it's okay on subbo. So subbo the whole, but actually, it's if we look at the actual example, itiasa to itchasa, that is only t that's replaced, not iti. Um, so how does that work? Yeah. So. The sabo means sabo t. So all the t, the entire t, so not only the vowel of t. So here we have we have the 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 syllable t, right? Mm. So this syllable, the entire syllable is changed with cha. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I I yeah, I misunderstood. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> welcome. So yeah, it's the is the sabo iti so t sado. So t sado in the vuti means the word t, not the word iti. It's, for instance, the T appears in the word ET, it also appears in, in other words. But the, uh, basically, I, I, I think this rule is, is to explain why this ET is, becomes itch in many cases in, in Pali. So, as we were saying, after Sabo Chanti, we have Do Da Sacha. Very interesting rule, and many of you might have already read it because we are reading the beginning of Kachina 
And in many courses, we just read the beginning of any book. We and everyone knows the beginning of many books, but we don't know the entire book. So maybe this this is something you have already seen. This this rule is famous for for the cha because this cha is not exactly an uh, an anubuti. It's not so clear what this cha is is meant for. But in the vuti itself, there is a continuation. So that that's a continuation of of the vuti of Kachana 20. So it says kochi tikasma. And then Vagahanena, the Kara Sahakara de Soho. This is a this is a typo that I copied from the Chata Sangaina. It should say obviously Chagahanena. Sorry about that. And then the Vuti continues. Sutta Bivagena Bahudasiya. Now this of course many people will say, well, this is a note by someone else. This was not written by the author of the Vuti. Maybe actually this someone uh, added the cha or the, he's just changing the meaning of cha or giving it more meaning, which is something otherwise allowed in the grammar. You can you can split the sutta into two. That's what he's saying, with what he's trying to do. Sutta vibhaga means the, the division of the sutta. Some, uh, sometimes it's called yoga vibhaga. It means the same, sutra vibhaga, yoga vibhaga. And he says, by the division of the sutta into two, by splitting the sutta, bahudasya. So you would have many more similar replacements. For instance, to dasa yata sugato. So su, sugato would mean actually su, su, sugado. Ta has replaced da. To dasa dukkatam or dukkatam do dasa etc. Here, what what he's saying with the sutta vibhaga is that in in this rule, do dasa cha, you could create two two different rules. Do dasa, one rule, and cha, another rule. That would be strange, but this cha would mean and so on, something like that, and so on, and similar similar types of replacement of consonants. So, but we are again, we are not very much concerned here with this extension of the rule. Let's focus on the the main meaning of the rule. It says da iti etasa sarebare kochi the kara de sohoti. It follows the similar structure of 19, nominative and genitive. So instead, instead of the, you have the. So instead of aspirate, you have non-aspirate. So we change structure. The word cha in theory should indicate recurrence, but as you see in the Vuti, it has it is understood in a different way. You can see also that there is there is there are two different understandings of cha in the Vuti. And if you, if we again go back to this kind of uh, visualization, you have in 18 nominative and genitive vam odu dantanam sare pare kuchi. In 19 you have nominative and accusative. That's a different way of expressing replacement. And then in Kachana 20 you have do dasa cha. The cha is a modulator. In theory, it's it's indicating anubuti. Uh, and you see that it's the same structure. So. It replaces the entire the entire sutta sabbocham or saboti cham or sabbochanti. Now the question, very easy question, would be what is recurring here? What do we have to read again? As you as you could see, in theory that this cha means everything is recurring, that is not cancelled. If you understand the cha strictly, that would mean simply everything is recurring. Here we are not going to go into the details of this cha because, as you have seen, and this is also very common, and that has been the reason for many criticisms of the Kachana grammar. The use of cha is not very rigorous here in the Vuti. But otherwise, the Anubuti or re recurrence, I think, is quite easy. You can see that we are still under the domain of Kachana 12 and under the subdomain of Kachana 14. Now, as we said before, this in Sabbo Chanti, what is in, well, if, if you would ask what would be the point of changing the structure, why not keeping the nominative genitive type of replacement? Maybe, I'm just guessing, the point is to mark a difference between the replacement that affects the end of, a, of the ending sound of, a, of an item, like in Kachan 18, versus or vis-a-vis -vis, the, the rule that applies to a replacement of an entire, an entire item, an entire form, Kachan 19. Now we are approaching the end. There are 22 suttas in this chapter, so we are almost done with it. After do dasa cha, we have another rule that has received a lot of commentaries because of the option marker nava. Ivano yam nava. 
And again, we have Ivano in the nominative, Yam in the accusative. You can say Yakaram Papoti. This Papoti is the verb, it's a transitive verb. It's already telling you that Yakaram is the accusative. And then, interestingly, you have another option marker, Nava, that you, you have seen before. Kwachi, Nava, Chayekata, Yebuyena, Karupaka. So Kwachi and Nava, they have the same meaning, one and the same meaning. And so what, what happens here? That's the question. So we had uh, Kwachi recurring from previous from previous suttas. And if you if you look at the Bhutti of Kachana 21, this Kwachi is gone. You still see Sare Pare from Kachana 12, but the Kwachi is just gone because, as you can rightly guess, it has been replaced by another option marker, Nava. So that's more or less what we have. Yeah, we had the Sare Pare and Kwachi recurring, but in Kachana 21, Yam Iwa no Nava. This Nava is blocking or cancelling the Kwachi. So the only thing that will recur is, I mean, the structure comes from nominative and accusative, like in 19. So Do Dasa is again cancelled because these are the elements of the replacement. And Sare Pare continues, the Kwachi does not continue. That most importantly, this that's, that's the that's the point I want to make, that the Kwachi is no longer continuing because Nava has cancelled it. So now we open a new subdomain with the optional marker Nava. Finally, after Ivano Yam Nava, we have Eva Adisari Pubocha Raso. This is a long sutta, again with a very strange wording. I think if it's the first time that you read it, it's strange. Pubo is easy to understand, it's straightforward, it means just preceding the previous. Raso is a word that you have seen in the beginning, it's defined, so the rasas are a, i, u, that's uh, raso, saro, and it, this is in the nominative. And then evadisa, strange wording, but you are already used to these types of, uh, of compounds. If you look at the buddhi, the first part of, of the sut of the sutta is, is eva disa ri. Ri is a nominative. Eva disa is a genitive. So ri replaces the adi, that means the beginning of eva of the word eva. So saram ha after a vowel, parasa evasa. So of the following eva, ekarasa. So of the e of the following eva, adisa, which is at the beginning the e, which is at the beginning of the following eva, ri karo hoti, it becomes ri. The word karo, as I said before, simply means the form, the form ri. In this case, it can be one single sound, it can be a, an expression. In this case, so ri replaces e. And then the second part of the rule, pubo charaso, and the preceding one, obviously, becomes short. Finally, you have to uh, read nava, from Kachana 21 is recurring. So I would call this first bit of the rule 22a, the second one 22b, and that's more or less what we would have, what we would see. So yam even no in or even no yam in Kachana 21, sare pare recur, nava is introduced, and then in Kachana 22a, ri eva disa, that simply means that ri replaces e of eva. Now, because the word evadi indicates the beginning sound of the word eva, this, that is the sound e, it immediately cancels the right context sare pare that was coming by recurrence, because this recurrence would cause something called prasanga. That means an unwanted consequence. So if we would keep reading sare pare, we would have a, a contradiction because we would not know what is more important to read the, the it, it, does it apply to any any uh, vowel that follows, or we are referring to the vowel e that follows in this specific case? So there would be a contradiction, and we would have an unwanted result or unwanted consequence. The grammarians already know that, or someone who is trained in grammar understands that, and that's why you understand that sadepare is cancelled by the formulation of this sutta. So you don't need to cancel with anything else. Now the second part of uh, Kachana 22, Pubo Raso Cha, and also the preceding vowel becomes short, gives us this final formulation, Ri Evadisa Pubo Cha Raso Nava. So the only thing that recurs from Kachana 21 is Nava, 
and that means that Kachana 21 and 22 belong to the same subdomain headed by Nava. So now to more or less summarize and, and summarize what we have seen today, the, the entire chapter, you find it here, you see all the, all the rules that we have seen. They're actually quite easy to memorize. You have the translation in the handout, and of course you have many translations in the Google Drive, so you can you can go through it again if you if you wish. Uh, but this is this is what you see, and you remember that in in the first day we say one one thing is what we see, another thing is what we have to understand. We try to see the different levels or different domains in the grammar. So what we have seen today is that this chapter actually has to be understood in this way, and this means that we have. At least or we can distinguish three different levels. The first one, level one, is, is the heading of the chapter, Sarasare Lopam. That we could call it Utsarga or general rule. That's the general state of affairs. So in case one vowel meets another vowel, there is a lesion of the preceding one. Then we have one subdomain, optional. In the case that they are dissimilar, then optionally the following one can be elided. So that's the level two. This, at the same level, you have the domain opened by Kachana 14 with the option marker Kwachi. That's, what, that's why you say Va Adhikara, that means having the Adhikara or the heading Va. Kwachi Adhikara means having the heading Kwachi. And in Kachana 21, Nava Adhikara means having the heading Nava. So this, this would be the second, the second level, the first subdomain. And then there would be another level that, that means all the rules that are included, if there are any, in these subdomains, and of course, you, as you can imagine, you could go, you could go further, and you could create new, new subdomains, so sub subdomains, and so on. So this is more or less what you, what you have to see. I hope it was, it was clear, not too complicated. Uh, so now we have a little bit of time for questions. That at, at the request of Professor Kate, I made it a little bit longer today with more examples, but I'm not so sure if this actually created more confusion than. <laughs> than, than clarity, but in any case, thank you very much for, for your patience. Thank you very much, Alesh. Very clear. Um, uh, it's quite complex, and I just wanted uh, to point out that um, the handout is particularly useful because for each rule there's an example, so we can see what it means in practice. Um, I have a few questions, but I wonder, but I don't want mine to be prioritised, so perhaps you can see if there are others as well and just hold on to mine for a moment. So um, one of my questions is about, um, it, it refers back to actually to this issue of, of generative or descriptive. So it seems to me that Pali has a lot of different forms of vowel Sunday. And that this, that Kachina is therefore much more complex than Panani, for example, when it comes to vowel Sunday. And I just wanted your your thoughts on that. Um, another question is just one of those small questions about variety, which is in um, Kachina 15 in the commentary we have Lutte. In 16 we have Lope Kate. And I is that just bringing the changes, or is there a reason that we would have the different um, uh, different phrasing there. Um, I think there was a third question, but I've forgotten it now. Um, oh yeah, why are the long vowels not in the equivalent of the Shiva Sutras, whatever they're called? Why are they taught in the grammar rather than given in the summary of the alphabet? Uh, those are my questions, but if others have questions, let's should we gather those now rather than me taking up the time? Okay, could could you please repeat the the last question? So why are the vowels? The so in the Shiva Sutras, I've forgotten what you call them with Kachana. Um, what are the, you only have? Uh, uh, and then ao, you don't have uh, uh, e, e, ooh, ooh. so you don't have the long the diga vowels. You just have the short vowels. So I wondered why those the lengthening of the vowels is taught in the grammar rather than given in the summary of the alphabet. Hmm. Okay. 
So as for the Sandy, that's something I have become very much interested lately because I started looking at the at option markers in the in the grammar, and actually there is a there is an article that hopefully will be published soon uh, about option markers in the Rupa CD, which is a grammar of the Kachena tradition. And by looking at the way the grammarians understand the option markers, then you you see that they they try to make sense of what they have in the grammatical text, that means the Kachina in this case, and some other grammarians, and compare it to what they see, or we have to understand that they are comparing it to what they see in the manuscripts, in the manuscript of the canonical tradition, basically, because that is the Pali. And there are many cases where what the traditional grammars say, or the classical grammarians say, is much more precise than what many modern scholars have understood. But to understand this, we have to read and go through the commentaries. And also we have to understand and we have to accept that there is disagreement and discrepancy between different grammarians. So there is no single discourse of the Pali grammarians. Each grammarian is an individual, I guess, or, or a different school, different approach. And you will see that in different grammars, you, you find different interpretations. And in many of them, as it is the, the style of the commentators, they will give you maybe two or three options in terms of interpretation of a rule. So uh, that connected to, to the Sandhi, of course, in, in, in Pali, it seems to be more complicated than in the Panini or classical Sanskrit grammar. But I think the grammarians are trying to make sense of what they see. And in some cases, I have seen that they establish different degrees of optionality and they recognize that there are some Sandhi forms that we could call them uh, fossilized or, or frozen. And therefore, there are certain types of Sandhi that only occur in a certain way. That meaning, for instance, that in when certain words are united, only one form of Sandhi is possible. So you don't have many options. And that's, that's descriptive. That's a descriptive approach. It's not a generative approach. That's not, they are not telling what you can do. They are telling you what you find in the Tipitaka. So I hope that, that works as a kind of answer. But yeah, we need more research. I'm 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 interested in this in this topic actually. I, I think there is there is a lot of stuff in the grammatical literature that has not been really explored or taken seriously. Maybe taken seriously is the right expression here. Usually we we see it as something very confusing because it is sometimes it's very complex, it's not expressed in a way that we would use today. So we think, well, basically that is nonsense. They don't know how they are using the words. They put everything together. There are like 15 people who have been writing on what we call the like Kachina and everyone is adding new stuff. But but then again and again, there will be a grammarian or a commentator that is one single person and tries to tries to systematize. And these scholars, they were familiar with the Tipitaka. They were familiar with the manuscripts. So I don't think that what they say is, is nonsense, or at least we should take it seriously. Should should try to see what they what they are trying to say. Uh, then regarding the Lutecate, I think that's a, to, to, to go for a short answer, it's a common way of glossing. So in theory, it should not be problematic. That's a, a way of, it, it, this is understood from the context, from the meaning of the sutta using paro. So you understand that uh, instead of being the previous vowel that is elided, is the next one or is elided or is lengthened or is changed into a savanna. And we take the Lutecate from the first from the rule 12, but so after the elision has been done, that's why uh, Lopam Papoti is still there, but uh, Sarepare is not, is not there. So the order of the vowels is changed, but there is an elision. Mm. And the other question about the Shiva Sutras and, and why the description is done in this way, actually that again, I don't know very well, but in theory, so it, in the yeah, in the I, I was also writing something something about that in the when I was doing my PhD. Then I, I left it. There is a kind of article that maybe I will try to revise at some point. But that is related to the first sutta or sutra of the Kachina, and how uh, originally it could have meant that what follows is the teaching of the sounds, and that's what we would find in the in the Pratishakyas and the Katantra. 
but then they change the wording of the sutta and it means something different. So offic officially, the beginning of the grammar begin is, is in China too. That's where you have the list of sounds. Uh, it, it tells you that there are there are 40, 41 sounds in Pali. And then the Buddhi enumerates those sounds. So, and then the, the list of diga of longs is given in, in one of the suttas. And that is, you have we have to understand that this sutta that is, is a definition is one thing. But then there are other other suttas that they are operations. So when diga is operation, that's not a definition. It's using the definition in order to prescribe that there is lengthening. So I don't know if that was the question, but one one ambiguity that we can have here is that, uh, of course, when you see diga, diga means long, but sometimes diga means make it long. It's an operation, Le lengthening. That's why the commentary will say digam papoti. It, it obtains the lengthening or obtains the long form. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you very much. That's yeah. wonderful. I don't know. It, I, I have some time, so if there are some more questions, I'm happy to. And if uh, people could remember just to put their time zone um, if they're interested in um, continue starting a new class looking through the grammar. You have a question from Adam Clark, uh, Elish. Yeah. So this grammar gives one a foothold for the grammar, but purely on its own, it wouldn't seem enough to learn the language. I wonder whether it is possible to briefly comment on traditional in Myanmar, what other systematic style texts would be people used to incorporate, say, the verb forms vocabulary. Yeah. Mm, yeah, that, that's a good question. When we study the grammar, like in this case, if we are using the Kachina, probably no one reads the Kachina only with the Kachina book and the Buddhi. Especially in Myanmar, they have translations into Myanmar language. In Sri Lanka, they also have translations. They have other grammars, modern treatises. And I think that's been the case throughout history. But there was probably a moment in the past where people were more familiar with the language and what they were trying to learn in the grammar was not so much Pali, but how Pali works. Maybe they were already familiar with, with uh, Sanskrit or with Indian classical languages. That I, I'm, it's not very clear. I also understand that maybe uh, in, in different periods there have been different needs. In different regions also there have been different needs. So. I think we cannot extrapolate our situation today with uh, what happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 500 years ago or 1000 years ago. So to make a, a general statement about the use of the grammar and why it is used for, that is very difficult, I think, because the use is something that people, people do. And then you would, you would actually need to ask people and see how they do it, how they learn it. What I've seen today is that in Myanmar, for instance, they have many manuals written in, in Burmese language that are very helpful. They basically explain uh, in full, in very in, in detail, all the intricacies of the grammar. These manuals are written by great sayados or, or masters who have read all the commentaries and they can summarize it in a way m much better than my way. And they summarize it, they try to make it clear for students. The question would be again, like, is it is it <laughs> is it worth the effort? Like, why do you need to to learn all that if you can learn Pali grammar using a modern book that will teach you the language? I think these are two different things, as we said before. One doesn't study the Kachina grammar because one wants to learn Pali. You already need to know some Pali. Probably what what you want when you study the Kachina is to understand a little bit better how the grammatical thought works in the tradition so that when you read commentaries you will try you will understand better what they mean and why they use certain ways of expl explaining words after all a commentary of course it explains words and meanings so a commentary is, is among other things a philological instrument and commentators were familiar with grammar of course and when they are commenting or glossing a word uh, in the back of their minds there are grammatical processes that are running we don't see them, but that's how they are thinking. If we study traditional grammar, for instance, with the Kachina, that is very easy, then we can understand better some explanations in the commentaries, I mean, in the classical commentaries of Buddha Gosa or Dhammapala, 
And this commentary is, it, I think there is a agreement among uh, many of us that they are very helpful when we are reading the Tipitaka. So in that way, I would say learning the Kachina is helpful when we read the Tipitaka. Otherwise, if someone is just interested in, in learning Pali as a new language and so on, I don't think studying the Kachina is, is a good is a good decision. I, I, I wouldn't do that or wouldn't recommend that. That's why I have received uh, some of my friends or, or, or colleagues. I say, should, should I attend this course, the introduction to the Kachina? I'm interested in Pali, should I attend it? Well, it, it depends. It depends on what is your interest, how much you, if, if you want to continue studying traditional grammar, in the long run, I think it will help. But it's not something that you can do a crash course and you have the basis of traditional grammar and from there you can navigate. I don't think that works in this way. Many of you probably remember that in, in the tradition it is said that uh, to study Panini takes 12 years, 12 years of, of continuous study. Then in the tradition of the Katantra, it was said that Sherva Varman challenged this, this idea and he said that he could teach Sanskrit grammar in six months, so he composed uh, the Katantra. So maybe the Kachina is uh, Pali grammar in, in 12, uh, I don't know, uh, three, three months or, or two weeks, I don't know. But it's not so simple for us. So yeah, what, in summary, what I would say, this is not exactly for learning the language, learning a new language, is to under, understand language. There is another question. Uh, Andrew Skilton. What are the marker stems that indicate chapter start and end, i.e. container restricted? That's, uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Generally speaking, I think we could say that the beginning of every, so there are the, the typical endings of a chapter. So the chapter so-and-so has ended, nititam or nitito, patamokando uh, nitito. So that marks the end of a chapter and that cancels immediately all the domains that were opened in the, in the chapter. So whenever we start a, a new chapter or new section of the Kachina, we start afresh. So nothing is uh, nothing is taken by Anubhuti. But there's always a but. There are some adhikaras or some domains that can affect everything that goes after or, 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 or even the, the entire grammar. And one example is the rule, I think it's 51 or 52, Jinava uh, Chanayuttam Hi. It depends on which edition we look, Jinava Chanayuttam Hi. That's the first rule in the nama nama kappa in the nominal morphophonemic section the nominal section and that rule according to commentators affects the entire grammar so this is a general domain very broad it simply means that whatever we find in the grammar has to be uh, according to the speech of the buddha the jina but otherwise the the end of chapters and sections that is marked in the traditional way uh, nitito nititam uh, cancels all the all the annuity. So, okay, I think we that's it for today. So next next Wednesday we are meeting again. We'll have the last session. Thank you very much for your patience and for staying here. I hope it it is useful. And for those who couldn't come or who are watching on YouTube, also thank you for for watching. And we, are, we will meet next week. Thank you very much.